Let's start it off with a round of applause for her. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I forgot what it was like to be around kids that say good morning to me. Um, so uh, I just I was told to kind of talk a little bit about my background, and then maybe some I don't know tips and tricks and ideas. So I just kind of went with that. All right. So um, and because we've all done this before, we've probably heard the speakers before. If you have questions. Just don't forget them if you don't mind, and that way we have stuff to think about at the end together. Because that's important, right? Otherwise, it's just a one way. So just think of stuff you can ask, because I don't want to go on the whole time. Um, I am going to put this on, so I don't, so I don't go on the whole time. So yes, as Janine said, my name is uh, Angela Christian, and uh, we can move forward. I am going to talk, like I said, about my background. So let's just kind of get into it. Um, so I grew up in Houston, Texas. And uh, I was born in Kansas, actually. My dad came here from India to, to get his education. And, uh, and so I am born and raised in America. And, uh, and so very soon after I was born, my parents moved to Houston, Texas. I'm the third daughter. And uh, so I spent my whole, uh, you know, my, my youth in Houston. Went to public schools, public high school as well. And um, eventually ended up going to Rice University. If any of you have heard of Rice, it's a pretty small private school. Yep. Um, and I majored in electrical engineering. And I, it was okay. It wasn't my favorite. I did it, it just, it happened. But it wasn't my favorite. What I did figure out during that degree though was that I liked to write also. So I ended up actually double majoring in anthropology. So strange human because I, I, I like the math and science stuff but then I kind of like the writing and the philosophy type stuff so I couldn't couldn't quite get my head around what is it I really like um, so I guess that's my first piece of advice you don't need to know everything right now um, life is about going with the flow learning as you go so I just kind of did it I got through it um, and I, I spent years because it's kind of nice to, to not be afraid of my age I'm 53 um, and so, yeah, do it. Are we really? Yeah. I love 53 uh, so far. <laughs> it's yeah. not bad, right? No. So getting there, it's just sort of, so that was 96, 86 to 90, so you can kind of imagine that. That was a while back. Actually, most of you probably weren't even born or, or, or maybe not even thought of yet, um, which is okay. But um, those four years, what happened in 90 was kind of interesting. I, so graduating in 90 was is significant because that's when the internet first started kind of booming and when people were doing websites. And uh, what happened was we got carried away. So when I teach internet marketing, I always talk about that. So right around 90, a lot of the software companies were really crazy. They were hiring, they had a lot of funding. So after graduating, I got my first job in California in a place called Oracle Corporation, which maybe a lot of you have heard of. If you haven't, you definitely use their stuff. Like they are the back end of almost every bank at every university, we are we're using their stuff. People's off is also owned by Oracle. It's a big database company, right? So they store information about people and things. Um, and then in 90, a few months later, they laid off a ton of people. I survived the layoff, but in my head, I think I, I lost my loyalty to Oracle. <laughs> so I had already quit Oracle and gone to another company within a year. I went to a company called Information Dimensions within a year, got a raise, of course, at the time was supporting somebody in school, so I really needed to worry about my income. Um, and then within two years, I decided to move to Cleveland, Ohio. So I uh, spent a couple years in California, I was battling the, the uh, was working 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. because of the traffic, um, which was not fun. I had to go to bed at you know, 8 o'clock at night. Um, so I said, you know what, this is for the birds, I'm gonna try Cleveland. So we moved to Cleveland and weirdly, <laughs> I accepted a job at a company called Lincoln Electric. And I had made that connection when I was at Rice. And Lincoln Electric is a welding company. And um, so it was a huge shift to go from software to, to, to manufacturing. And I became a certified welder. And then I said, I don't like this. <laughs> and I went back to Oracle in Cleveland, spent just a few years in Cleveland, realized I'm not a huge fan of, of uh, six months of snow, and ended up moving to Virginia. And I spent about 13 years in Virginia. So I, I actually, uh, until now, it's been a lot of my life in Virginia. Now I can kind of pass that up in Nevada. So as you can see, I've kind of moved around a lot. Um, and in Virginia, I also worked full-time for many years. 
So that's kind of the second bullet. Uh, I, in total, I worked 13 years before I went back full time to school again. Um, and during that time, I got my MBA. So an MBA is basically, it's called Master's of Business Administration. It is a kind of a cool degree where you, um, we, we uh, and now I'm directing the program, we are interested in students who have a really broad range of background. They, they may not know what they want to do in the future. They're sort of dabbling and they want to become managers of some sort, but they may not know in what field. So I got that part-time while working full-time. So we have, that's our current program at UNLV, is a part-time MBA program. Uh, so a lot of our students work full-time and they get their master's. And then I decided to go back to school again. So in 2003, I went back full-time to Virginia Tech to get my PhD. And uh, it was a four-year program. And since I graduated in 2007 and accepted the job here, so since 2007, I've lived in Nevada and I've worked for UNLV. So that's kind of my whole background. Um, as you can see, I've moved around quite a bit. I you know, grew up in Houston, lived in California, then Ohio, then Virginia, and now Nevada. So, um, I guess the first thing to tell you is you don't know. You don't know where life is going to take you, uh, and, and it, it can be a lot of fun. And I've had uh, a great time seeing these different places. Um, so that's all I wanted to do by way of background. But I did think I did want to say that I have I do have a brand, um, and something that I wanted to talk for a bit about with you today was building your own personal brand, thinking about your brand. Um, and actually, I was asked to give a talk that. It's brand new that faculty are going to be watching and, and then uh, using in, in the classroom, and it's on building your personal brand. So I'm going to see how the time goes, but I might want to show it to you. It's about five minutes. Um, but at the bottom, I have a couple things. One is athlete plus academic, and I and I say that because that is kind of that that has been fundamental to who I am um, and, and how I raise my daughters and how what I do in the classroom. Pretty much everything I am about um, is about being both. Um, I've always told my kids, you don't have to pick. You know, you can, you can be a runner. You can wear lipstick. You can uh, be an academic. You can, um, you know, be super serious sometimes and super fun other times. And, and you don't have to pick. You don't have to be one thing. You can figure out how to merge yourself together. And so, for me, being athletic has, has always been really fundamental, and I've done it. I've always I count my steps. I have my watch on. Uh, just because it helps me. For me, um, health is as important as anything else, I'd say well. But life is not just about a job. You have to have your physical and mental health. So that, like I said, has been fundamental. And I have a website. Um, it's actually built by uh, my former students, and they've maintained it. But, but it, it has the athlete, athlete academic filter. I haven't really, unfortunately, kept up with that one. And then I have the one that's the UNLV website, which is, I tend to use that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, let's move forward. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about a few things that I've, so I've, I've, had, I've over the years given talks. That's kind of something that I think as university professors, we tend to do a decent amount of these. We, um, and some of us more than others, but that is something that has been fairly, fairly constant for me is that I have done talks over the years. And so one was uh, UNLV Creates Talk. That's a talk that we have brand new undergraduates come do, so it'd be you in a few years, hopefully, some of you and I'll be if you want to. Um, and they come in, and there's just tons of them, and we're on a stage, whoever gives the talk. And so the, the talk that I gave a few years ago kind of brought in this, and you can keep hitting the buttons, but it's, I called it consuming to creating, watching to doing, seeing to being. And so what do I mean by that? And so it, it's a talk of itself. It is on the internet if you ever want to watch it. But it, I don't want to give the whole talk, but what I was going to say was, um, I bring that in because as marketing uh, faculty, what I, what I research is called consumer behavior. And so we talk a lot about how consumption is everything. I mean, of course, I think marketing is, is fundamental. Whoever teaches whatever they teach is always going to say that to you. Uh, but right now, you're consuming. You're consuming whatever I'm telling you, my information. Right? Take a breath. Let it out. You're consuming air, right? And you need air, and air feels good. Um, and and to live, you're consuming food. Um, you probably consume digital stuff all the time. Right? You love your phones, you love your, your, your Netflix, or your TikTok, or whatever it is that you like. Um, and so consuming is really, really fundamental. We, we do it all the time. Um, and so I'm not saying not to consume. What I'm saying is sometimes think about creating too. Think about 
okay, so I've, I watched this Netflix show. What would it be like to create that? What would that feel like? Um, to create anything. What does it feel like to make my daughter make a demon? Um, what does it feel like to, to I don't know, uh, write a letter or, or um, draw a picture? We, we get so much pleasure out of creating. Um, and, and creating is ultimately what we want to make you. We want to make you creators. <laughs> we want you to think more about, about making things, doing things. So, so what I mean by this isn't that we shouldn't consume and watch and, and see. We should. But, but it's really great to think about shifting that a little bit more too. Shifting it to, um, and, and, and the examples I've always given are, um, it's great to watch a football game. It really is. But it's also fun to, to actually pick up a ball and move around. Um, or or it's, it's, you know, so being a spectator is wonderful. It's what we're taught to do. We do it all the time. Um, but getting up and actually doing stuff is so much harder. Um, and so that's why, you know, I tell people, and I do this a lot in the classroom, is, you know, what, what in Facebook did some of these things teach us? Some of it was not good. We know this, right? But one of the things that it taught us that was not good was, you know, you see this, this post, whatever, or Instagram. And you have a lot of them, but now they have it. Um, I asked my students, who cares? Who cares? Why is that a metric? Who, who cares if somebody likes something? It doesn't matter. It needs to exist in a vacuum. Knowledge exists. It does. Nobody ever asked somebody, do, do you like, you know, the theory of relativity? Do you like it? You know, do you like gravity? I mean, hopefully you do, because they don't have a choice. <laughs> they exist. I mean, if I, if I pick the phone up and throw it, it's probably going to drop it right. Um, it's like shift away from that idea of, of constantly trying to judge things constantly trying to watch and see what other people do or what, whether you like it or not, and shift into creating your own stuff. Because guess what? It's hard. It's very hard. It's very hard to be on the right-hand side of this. It's a lot harder to run a 5K than it is to watch somebody else run it. So why do we become judgmental? Why do we think about things in a do I like or not like? It's because we're not doing it ourselves. You're much less likely to be judgmental of other people and other things when you actually get in this, stand in their shoes, when you start to do stuff yourself. Weird, it happens. Like I, maybe if I, if I, if my daughter did make these, might not like them that much, right? But I know how hard it was for her to make them. I know it took her creativity. She had to think about it. She had to watch videos. She had to buy the stuff. She had to put it together. The gift means a lot to me. I can go buy a pair of earrings and them for that. But the fact that she made them for me, that it was something that she put her heart into, it makes me feel valuable. So I always say, think about that right hand side. Think every day when you wake up and every night when you go to bed. What did I create today? What did I do? Did I just watch? Did I see other people doing stuff or did I actually do something myself? And I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a TikTok video. I don't care what it is. Just create stuff. Think about things you can do rather than always looking at other people, judging other people. It's fun, but it, but it doesn't get you anywhere. So that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. Kind of the second thing was kind of a, another kind of core philosophy that I've had for a long time. I did a TED talk years ago, and I got interested a long time ago in this idea of opposition. And um, yeah, and again, you know, I said I'm not going to give the whole TED talk right now, but I kind of in the mix of that TED talk and kind of as I move forward in my career and my life, it, it's these three fundamental things of opposition, creativity, and motivation. And we saw creativity a minute ago have kind of become my fundamental pillars. They, I call them my trifecta. Um, and the reason is because opposition, sometimes you have to oppose things that contain you, that, that stop you from being a true self I think we talk. Um, you're always going to have opposition. You're going to have people or things or places that just make you feel contained, that don't, don't let you breathe. You feel, wow, I'm not, I'm not able to be who I am, who I, who I want to be. Maybe these people don't accept me. Maybe people look at me and think certain things about me that may or may not be true. Um, maybe the way I look or how I carry myself is creating this force from, from other people for no reason. Opposition, what I mean by that is don't let those things continue. That's when you oppose them. No, 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 no. You don't know me. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I can do. Um, don't, don't get, don't fall prey to, to falling into those, those pits. Um, as a woman, as a person of color, but also not 
a person of every color, right? I haven't had a great experience. I don't know. Um, I'm always open to, to learning, learning from people that look like me, learning from people that don't look like me, understanding that there's things that I've had that other people don't have. There's, there's privileges that I've had that other people don't have. And being open to that, being understanding of that. Um, but not everybody is. You're gonna go in life and you're gonna have these people, they're gonna oppose you, they're gonna think certain things of you, they're gonna make assumptions about you. Don't get sucked into that pit. So that's what I mean by opposition. It doesn't mean you get angry. Sometimes maybe you do. Maybe you can do it. If you get angry, figure out how to deal with that in a creative way. Figure out how to use that to be creative. So for me, opposition, I, I talk about that in my talk, but really running is my sport. It's the sport that I like, it's what I do. Um, it sort of let me process things. Whenever things aren't going my way, whenever I feel that opposition around me, whether it's, it can be your parents, it can be your friends, it can be your family, it can be who you think is your friend that's not your friend, right? It can be your authority figures that are somehow making you feel special. Figure out how you can turn that around and feel that. Okay? For me, that was running or some, some, something that sort of lets me process it. Um, that, so that's why I say creativity. For me, be creative in, and again, just coming back to what I said a minute ago about creating things, doing things. And the last one, motivation, because finish what you start. It's so funny how few people realize how important that is. It, it puts you in a totally different type of I'd say 90% of the people that are out there can start with. Start with. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make earrings. And then, and then they're one third of the way through and it was just sitting there piled up on the floor. <laughs> a month, two months, three months, six months, thankfully in the fresh. Um, finishing what you start is massive, it's huge. And that's why I talk about motivation because it's hard. It's a lot harder to finish question. It's a lot harder to finish than to start. So be thinking about that, right? Be thinking about how often do I start things that I don't finish? And then what do I do about it? How do I motivate myself to finish that? Because that, that's tough. So those are kind of three pillars that I've looked on that I've loved and that, that have kind of formed uh, my fundamental beliefs. We can keep going. As always, whenever I get a talk, I have two of these slides, so we'll finish what we finish. And I do want questions. Um, so I kind of talk about in the middle of these three things, opposition, creativity, motivation. I call it decontextualizing. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Context is where we are. It's our, it's our surroundings, right? And I say that I want you to think about as you move forward in your life, eventually you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. And it's hard. Actually, going to college, the hardest thing about going to college is that comfort zone. The feeling like, man, I'm going to be a little ant, you know, and there's going to be a huge forest, and I'm just going to be crawling around this forest, and no one's going to know who I am. I don't want to get stepped on, you know, and I'm just going to be kind of lost. And, and that decontextualizing, that becoming the ant in the forest, it will change you forever. You will never be the same in a good way because it, it, it gets you out of your comfort zone. We're not meant to be, you know, be in the same place the whole life. We're supposed to grow and move and change. We're supposed to meet people. Today I met somebody that I didn't know on the same campus. So it, it's that decontextualizing is what eventually will help you. You will learn to make your own friends, create new environments, and it's what makes. I'm going to say growing up, what you all like to call it adulting, is what makes it difficult. It really is hard. Um, so I like to say that some of, some of, some, sorry, sometimes what makes it difficult is the idea of success and failure. So something that I, that I want you to take away, and again, take away what works for you, right? These are just my ideas. They may or may not work, but take away what works for you. Um, but I want you to be thinking of success. I would love you to think of success as trying, just trying. And, and, and failure, think of that as not trying. You know, you start taking that away and you go, wow, that can really change my life. You know, I entered a competition, whatever it was. I don't know what competitions you guys had anymore. I had science fair, spelling bee, all of those things. History fair, you name it. And I never won half of them, you know? And it was a lot of work. I'm like, man, I gotta put this project together and I gotta be vulnerable because I gotta stand out there and talk to people I don't know. And then they walk away and I'm just kind of standing there feeling all judged. And then I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and then eventually my name doesn't get called because I don't win anything. And it's hard to not win, right? But 
But that shift that I did early on and that I, that I encourage you to do is, is to just try. Because guess what? Trying is success. If you decide that that's success, it can really shift your life. Because then you'll try a lot more things. You know? you'll, you'll be at the start line and actually finish something that you may not win. You may not even get any recognition for. It. But it's going to change you. It's going to create that sort of step change in your life. You're going to go, oh, wow, I did that. I did it. It's it. I won. Because I did it. Um, this is something that I taught my children. They, you know, I always joke around with, with people that have teenagers. <laughs> if your kids love you from 13 to 18, you did something wrong, um, right? Because if they love you, that means you, you, you just, you didn't make them try. <laughs> uh, my kids did not like me for a long time. For a long, long time, they didn't like me. And it stinks, it stinks to have people loving you and then one fine day they just decide that you're the enemy. Um, but it's because, you know, like, you're gonna try. You're gonna try this 5K with me. I don't care if you fall. I don't care if you skip. I don't care what you do. You're gonna start it and finish it. And we would always be at the last, the end of the pack. My daughter was cool. She started her first 5K. And we would be the very last one, and the whole place was cheering for us. We were in Virginia. <laughs> we had like 75 year old women that had finished before us, and 85 year old, you know, men and women. And, and, and here's my little daughter, and I'm holding gummy bears, and I'm just like feeding them one at a time. And she's like, Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I'm just because I want to teach you to finish them. So you started. And because you were cute. Who couldn't love a little four year old? But, but guess what? That that changed her. She, I just talked to her this morning on the way here. But, but that those experiences changed my kids. I could have been Taekwondo. They got beaten up. I come home, they had blood, bloody noses. You know, it's like, and why are you doing this to me, mommy? It's, it's you know, Thursday night at 8 o'clock, I'm tired. And I'm like, I know, so am I, and guess what, I'm in here with you. I don't want to be here either. I don't want to be here. Um, so I always say try. Just try something. Try something as often as you can. It doesn't matter what it is. And you all know how to learn things. You have so many more resources than I do. I, how did she, she learn to do this from a video. I, there were no videos when I was a kid. If I had to learn something, I had to buy a book and then hope to goodness they had decent pictures. You know, it's like, now you can learn anything. <laughs> so do it. You know, uh, I'm looking around. I don't see any masks that are decorated. I know that's a thing. I know kids like to do that. You know, you get some paints and you just paint your mask. So you gotta wear it all the time. Might as well look good. Um, yeah, here's your mask. Do stuff. Just do something. All right. Let's keep going. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm done with that. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to talk for a minute about, and I'm hoping that you all are going to ask me questions because, again, it gets boring to listen to someone talk about stuff. But I kind of want to talk for a second about some of the things that I've kind of lived by. Um, so I've learned in my life, anyway, knowledge is power. And by knowledge, I mean reading, writing, learning. Any, any, anything that I can learn from other people. I've learned from my parents. I've learned from my friends. Um, and I call it looking for those knowledge nuggets. You know, it's so much easier. Uh, I was just teaching class on Wednesday and at the end of my students had to do presentations and I said, at the end of the presentations, I said, I'm gonna say three good things about each one, each presentation. And they said, why? And I said, because it, 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 it's harder. It's harder to do that. Take a day, just take a day. I encourage you to do this. And try to think about only good thoughts for the whole day. It's freaking hard. It's really hard. We, we have this thing, it's actually been researched by uh, people, their names is Kahneman and Jersey. Okay? T V E R S K Y, if you want to look it up later. Um, it's called prospect theory, but it also, uh, a part of it is called negativity bias. We are actually co coded, part coded, but then society doesn't help, to think. To, to weigh negative thoughts heavier than positive thoughts. We are coded to weigh ne negative thoughts are higher than positive thoughts. So what does that mean? That means, first of all, if somebody says something mean to me, oh, I don't like your outfit, I don't like your hair, you're too old, you're too fat, you're too ugly, whatever. I'm gonna take that more into account. It's gonna make me feel worse than if somebody says something you're beautiful, you're smart, you're intelligent, you're perfect, whatever. That negative thought is going to actually weigh heavier on me and it's going to be more easily recalled. That's terrible. What that means is that, one, so what are the takeaways from that? One, don't say mean stuff to people. Because think about it, it's going to weigh that much more on them. 
They have to get five positive thoughts for that one negative thought. It's so hard for them to overcome that. Um, two, if you say it, you're thinking it. If you're thinking it, it's weighing you down too. Like the negative thoughts are just weighing you down. They're like a, an anchor and you're just sinking to the bottom of the ocean as if without a scuba tank, right? So that's what I mean when I say, you know, knowledge is power. It's, it's when, you, when you try to learn, when you try to make knowledge the center of your universe, what you'll notice is you're less judgmental. There's no place to judge knowledge. You know, if I ask you a simple question, um, if I say to you, ah, it turns out I have high cholesterol. How do I lower my cholesterol? Turns out that I've got high cholesterol. How do I lower my cholesterol? What would you do to answer that question? Somebody tell me. What would you do if I asked you that question right now? Yes. Offer advice. Offer advice. Where would you get the advice? Yes. With your hand. I'll tell you to go see a doctor because I I have no medical. Smart. I like it. Offer advice. Go see a doctor. What else? Yes. Uh, probably go to the ER. Tell me to go to the ER. What else? Yes. Ooh, I like that one too, do research. So I got four answers, see if I can remember them. <laughs> go to the doctor, go to the ER, right? Uh, offer advice and do research. What else, yes? Check your BMI, check your numbers. Good, check my numbers, check my BMI and my, and my other numbers, good. These are great answers. Um, and I liked all of them, and, and I think, to be truthful, I think most of us, if, we, if we're at home, we're just at home one fine day and, and we get a call from the doctor because we got our blood work done a couple months ago. Get a call from the doctor it's like, you know, you do need to watch your cholesterol. Pretty sure most of us are going to do, we're going to get on the computer, right? Or the laptop or the tablet or the da 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 da, -da whatever technology you have. And we're going to type in, right? How do I lower my cholesterol, right? That's what we're going to do. Yeah. Like when you get the blood work check, doesn't like the doctor give you advice to you yourself? When you do what? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, if you, so, so so if you're able to go to the doctor right away, you definitely would, right? You'd go to the doctor, they'd give you advice, their advice would come from a book or something that they learned, absolutely, right? Because they went to medical school and they got they got trained, right? So, so at some point, somebody did some research, somebody did some learning, somebody had some knowledge, either you're gonna find it yourself or you're gonna get it elsewhere. But like I said, most of us are gonna start with Google. We're gonna get on the Google, and it's a joke, right? People joke about it in movies and whatnot. Oh no, you know, you read it on WebMD. Um, but if we do Google it, we are trained, and you all are trained, I'm sure, already. Already at this age, you probably got trained even five to 10 years ago to start understanding and separating knowledge from information. You've already learned that. You've already, you already know if you Google it and it says, you know, I don't know, Reader's Digest? That was in my day, Reader's Digest was the one that you're like, eh, that's pretty much like, People magazine. I don't know if I can trust this source. Versus, you know, a journal paper, Journal of Academy of you know Medicine, as a source, you're going to trust one of them more than the other. You you have that ability to be able to tell already a credible from a less credible source. You know. So the point, my point to all of this is we already have the ability to kind of distinguish. You get it at a very young age. What is knowledge, what is not knowledge? Now all you have to do is figure out how to increase your knowledge. Because guess what? Knowledge really is power. It, it really is. The more you know, the more you understand, the more you become a critical source of information and knowledge for people, the more influence you can have, the more influence you can have, the bigger your network, the bigger the network, the more eventually you can influence people in a good way. So that, that's kind of how it all works. So that's my first one. The second one is, is firstly then uncovered. So what I mean by that, is, and don't think that anybody's pathway is easy. Nobody's pathway is easy. Some may be up more than others. But, I mean, there's a number of bumps along the road for, for everybody, I'm sure for both of us, that we have overcome. Um, so when I say this, when I, what I mean is, don't try to get into a system, right, where you have no idea what's going on, you're the ant, and try to disrupt the system. It's not gonna work. It's just not. First thing you have to do is actually start reading. You have to start volunteering. You have to start getting involved in things, learning, growing. Then eventually, if there's a problem and you go, you know, it turns out that there's this systemic issue. There's a problem here. Now people will listen to you because you've already started to lead. You've already started to influence. So, if that makes sense. So don't don't use you know use your platform wisely, right? 
but develop a platform. That means you have to work first. The engineering people, can you go with Mr. Thomas, those who are going over to engineering? If you can do that quietly. Sure. So um, then I said build your network. I hope that all of you, if you don't already, eventually will create a LinkedIn profile. It seems odd. I know you're really young. Um, but it's not bad to start early at all. Um, and so start to think about the life you start to think about how what what can that look like? What can that network look like? Who who would I want? If any of you ever want to find me on LinkedIn, I promise I will. I will be happy to accept your, your invite. Um, know who you can trust. That's important too. And what I mean by that is um, be careful. Be careful who you trust. Uh, sometimes people lead you down a bad pathway. Sometimes people uh, they act like they might be your friend. They might have your back, but it turns out mm, they're going to throw you in front of a bus. You got to be smart. You got to be thinking all the time. Can I trust this person? If so, why? Uh, that's another lesson that my kids at a very young age, I, I had to teach them and they didn't like it. They hated me for that. They didn't talk about it to them. They called me judgmental. They said, you know, mom, you're really judgmental. It's like, okay, but I'm trying to tell you to be careful. That's all I'm telling you. Be careful. Um, it's hard. It's a very difficult lesson. If you've ever been double-crossed, if you've ever felt like, man, you really knew somebody and then they turned on you, that can happen because you, you weren't careful with it. You, you know, so be careful. Know who you can trust. Start with your family. It seems odd. I know sometimes siblings are just the worst, but you probably can trust them more than anybody else. Uh, and your friends, your close friends. Um, performance, not popularity. That's important too. And I don't mean it's either or. You can be popular and have a high performance, but it's sometimes we forget performance. We think everything's about life, and 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 it's not. What's underneath it? What have you really done to get the life? Think about that. Because performance, it's more important to be to perform. Eventually, that's what separates the world, actually, to get things done, to be creative, to do things, than to just be liked by everybody. In the end, that's not going to get you where very far. Um, and we know that from, from years of looking at, at, at people, right? It, it, I think we think that, that it's easy to be popular, right? That it's, oh, they're so lucky they're popular, but that popularity kind of eventually isn't enough. It's not enough, so. Um, I say win the game and then change the rules. Don't ever try to change the rules of the game. It's not gonna work, not unless you want it first. Um, so if they tell you what the game, I always say, you know, tell me the rules of the game and I'll either win it or die trying. But just, just know the rules of the game. What, what is it I need to do here? What is it I need to, okay, I need to get all A's because I'm in school? Fine, I'll get all A's. Fine. Then I'll become the teacher, and then as a teacher, I can actually have an influence and I can change the rules. Maybe, maybe I change it up. Maybe it's not just about getting A's. Maybe it's about getting A's and being creative. I don't know. You can create the rules in your own classroom eventually, but you need to get there, right? So uh, I say do not be silenced. I think it's important to have a voice. Figure out what that voice is. What it can look like, like I said, be creative. Maybe, maybe again, you make videos. Maybe you write stories. Maybe you write poetry. Maybe you create things. Whatever. That's not being silenced. You can say how you feel. You can make, have a journal. You can write a book. These are things you can do. Um, so use your voice. Your voice is, is is one of the most important things you have, and it's what's changed the world, right? The ability to have these movements. All of these movements are are enabled by people using their voice creating you know, these incredible social movements that have happened over the past 5, 10, 15 years have changed the world. People have gotten together and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to be treated like this. And, and you can think of the number of, of movements that are out there. And, and every single one of these social justice movements happened because people were vulnerable. They, they were not silent. They chose not to be silent. And it takes, it takes work. Um, so that's important. If you have something you believe in, um, don't be silenced. Uh, and act what you expect. This is important too. You've ever heard, uh, you know, have you ever heard people saying, oh, this person, you know, they, they, they just preach, they don't, they don't actually do. It, it creates a really negative precedent. If, you, if people think you're one of those people that just tells people to do things, but you don't do them yourself, it's not good. 
So I always say, and that's what you expect. If I expected my kids to do things, I did it with them. I mean, I have a black belt. I didn't even want to do Taekwondo. But I was like, okay, fine. You get, you, get, you know, you're going to get mad if you have to, fine, I'll go with you. Whatever, I'll get beaten up, no problem. And I went and did it with them, just because I wanted to enact what I expected. I wanted them to know. If I expect you to do this stuff, I'll do it too. It's not a problem. And I would do, I don't say crazy, but I'd do some crazy stuff with my kids. I started this thing called Mile a Day. And, and they'd say, what is a mile a day? And I'd say, a mile a day is you do a mile every day. I don't care how. I'm going to be walk it, run it, bike it, skate it. Uh, I don't care. You can't have a motor. That's what I tell them. There's a motor, but you can do it on wheels. I don't care. What kind of wheels? And they just were like, okay, a mile a day, I'll do it. And sometimes they'd get to 8 o'clock at night, and they're like, oh, I didn't get a chance to go outside, Mommy. It's really cold. I was like, okay, the treadmill's in the basement. I used to get out of the basement to walk a mile. But it, it taught them something, you know? It taught them that it, it was a simple thing. It was a simple thing, but I was like, you know, movement's important. It's important for your body, it's important for your mind. Uh, and then commit complete. If you say you're gonna do something, get it finished, do it. That's the start, finish what you start with. Commit complete is another thing that I tell you what, the number of people who say, I will get that done, Angela, I'll do it. And a month later, I'm like, what happened? Number 11, so you're going to be able to finish it by the 15th. Are you sure? Because, yeah, yeah, I'm about the 15th. It's now the 25th, Christmas Day, and I'm like, yeah, I got nothing. Where is it? You think we can put up with that from Amazon? If they're like, oh, yeah, I'll get that to you in three days, and then it showed up like six months later, I think we'd get pretty mad. In some cases, it just disappears, right? People just commit to things and then don't ever do them. They're like, oh, yeah, I never said that. People avoid those people. So don't make empty promises. It's like if you say you're going to get something done, do it. And guess what? If you can't, if you can't do it, then don't say you're going to do it. It's like a magical thing. It's magical because it's like I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth. I found myself a bazillion times saying that. Guess what? There's no physical way I can do this. This this talk was going to be December 4th, right? Yeah. And then it had to move. And I said, and, and another colleague of mine said, I'll do it. And no, I said I was going to do it. I'll do it. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in town. I committed to it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow through because that's what I said I was going to do. So it, it is so fundamental to your core. Once you develop that philosophy, you just say no if you can't do it. It's like, Angela, can you do this, this, and this? It's like, you know, actually, no, I can't. I cannot do it. It's hard. It's hard to say, you know, I physically cannot do it by that day. You know, either either I, I get out of it, right? Or sometimes I say, I can't do it by this day, but I can do it by this day. You know, it's a month later. And I've had to go back and go, I committed to this date, but it turns out I need two more days. And they're okay with that. And then I get it done. So, it, it, and it's hard, it's hard to do that. Um, and then I have a video called Building Your Personal Brand, but I, 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 and I almost think that's all I want to say. I mean, I was gonna do that if, so let's go back one slide, because I just want to see if there's questions first, because I think you all might be in a place in which case I want to answer your question. Any questions? Any questions, raise your hand high. Everybody hear that question? Um, Isa, what's your name? Sorry? Julian. Julian? Okay, Julian said, how are you able to manage your time? Which, <laughs> I love that question. Um, so I had to go to a, a party thing last night. <laughs> and my husband dumped this on me at the last minute and I was so irritated. Um, and, it, and it was at five. Five o'clock on the strip. I thought, who does that? Like, who invites us to a dinner at five o'clock? I have a job. Um, so to, to your point, it, it was a crazy day yesterday because I run every day. If I don't run every day, my, my system, I, 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 I'm probably going to eventually, you know, mess up my knees. But at the moment, it is part of my thing. I do 14,000 steps a day and, and I run every day. And, and it's not, it doesn't matter, it might be a mile, it might be two miles, whatever. And so I find myself having to work around all of these weird things between I've got this deadline, that deadline, that deadline, and the top here, this, that and then meetings, and then now i got to get my drum run in, and then I'd be at some five o'clock dinner. So I don't know that I have it figured out. Um, I think I will say this. I have a, I didn't bring it with me, but I have, I, I, I use, I use a physical planner. It's called Passion Planner. If you like physical planners, um, this is a company that my daughter told me about that was started by a woman that, um, and it's, just, it's called Passion Planner. And she got, my daughter got into it, and I got into it. And I love it. And so for me, I will put things on there. Something that I learned about managing my time is I have to celebrate the things I am getting done. 
sometimes looking at Google Calendar gives me the hives because it's like it just ah, it just makes you feel like ah, it's like a suffocation on the screen. So I needed my planner so that I could go. Okay, I actually submitted blah 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 on you know I don't know December eighth, even though today wasn't my most wonderful day. I, I did this and it, I feel good about it. So for me, managing my time is a lot about um, just balancing and it's hard. And and, and, um, and again, I, I've been giving you tons of, of advice. I don't know how much of it's been used to you, but I really have to manage me as a human and what can I do and what do I need with everything else. And that's the hardest challenge for me. And, and I'm, I'm uh, on my second and hopefully last marriage but, <laughs> and my husband is also a faculty member and it's, we talk a lot because I think living with me is, is quite the trip because I'm always, do, I'm just always doing a lot of different things and I'm balancing a lot of stuff. But if, if you've ever spent time with me, you'll realize I don't, I try really hard not to sacrifice the things I need. And I try to be there for other people, but it is important to me. And so I started new things and, I, and I'm always learning. The last year or two I did learn, if I am trying to run, if I am trying to get my exercise in, that's my time. So I will not answer my phone unless it's my kids. And even if it's my kids, a lot of times I'll, and because I'm like, okay, it's, you know, whatever, four o'clock on a Friday, if my daughter's, and I have two daughters, if one of them's calling me, now they're both out of town, maybe something's up, I'll answer it, hey, I'm, I'm running. Okay, I'll play back. And that's what I do, because I just got to a point where it used to be that I would just get done. I would just stop my run and do whatever I had to do for somebody else. And I started learning that that was making me angry. I was getting upset about that. Because it was, because that was my time, and I needed that time. So, it's a balancing act, I guess. To answer your question, it's a balancing act. But I, will, I, I really encourage people to use tools. Use tools at your disposal. I, I mean, use a, a planner. Um, write down the things you have to do, a to-do list, and then, or your phone if you guys have the notes or things like that, or you want to use. There's so many new technologies for managing time. But use something and celebrate what you did not just what you have to do. Because sometimes just being driven by, I need to do this, 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 and this, it can kind of lead you down a pathway of stress all the time. So I guess, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Other questions, yeah? What was one of your uh, favorite things you have learned? In life, in my whole life? Yeah. Favorite things I've learned. I, I'll, do, I'll do a class and then, I'll, and then I'll do a life thing. I think the class thing was, um, I took a class called Social Psychology from Virginia Tech. It was this guy named Danny Axon taught the class, and I just loved the class. The, the professor never looked at a note. He just wrote all of the stuff was from the top of his head, and I was just crazy learning. But it just, I loved social psychology. It taught me so much. So I think that was one of my favorite classes I've ever taken. Favorite things I've learned, um, other than the class. I mean, I love Taekwondo, I'm not going to lie. In the beginning, I thought, this is the worst thing ever. What is this? Um, but after a while, it was really great because it's hard and it's bizarre and it's its own thing. But um, it's unapologetic. It's like you're going to be in here. I don't care what you do outside of this room right now. You know, you're nothing. You're just you're, you're just here. And I failed a lot because they make you do testing and they make you. Um, I don't, anybody in Taekwondo or any kind of martial art, right? And you go to do your test and then you fail it. They're like, nope, you can't have your body at me. And I just was like, what am I doing right now? not good you know and so between that and flying the next morning I had to fly all the way from Virginia to Nevada and that, that flight and I just remember thinking I tried I'm done I tried I tried I'm done and then I got back and Mr. Abbott talked to me he knew I was really upset and he and he talked to me that Saturday when I had gotten back on Saturday and he said are you okay and, 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 he, and he said you, you know you didn't cry or anything on the phone and I was like yeah yeah I didn't and, and I said yeah I'm okay and he said you're gonna try again I said yeah I'm gonna try again he said really you're moving. You're moving in a few, you know, like I was moving in a month or two, and I said, yeah, I'm going to try again. And I, and I think I failed it again, and then I passed it the third time. But I failed twice. So it's, that was a big, huge learning lesson for me. I think the most important thing I've learned, and I always tell that to Mr. Abbott, I still kept up with him, he's in Roanoke, Virginia now, but it's, you know, you can learn from the weirdest things, but to me, experience teaches you the most. It teaches you more than, than, than anything else. Other questions? Yeah, one last question. All right, one last question. Is it terrible? Is it hard? No, it's just like I was just wondering why you didn't have to do it. 
Yeah, why did I make my kids do it? I do more than a mile of it, but I, I made my kids do it. I don't know, that just felt like a really good number. And I used to tell, and, and, um, and I had this saying, I like sayings in case you guys didn't notice, they're all over the place. I used to say, any mile is a good mile. Um, and my kids actually took that to college. It, uh, that was my saying, whatever. They put it on a big board at, at school. But, but um, I don't know, I think I like it. I think it's just hard enough, but not too hard. It's hard enough that it doesn't, have you ever felt like you're being pushed a little bit too much? And, and, you're, and you're surviving it, but it stinks? I mean, you're just in this moment where that's what a mile does. To me, a mile is just enough that it, it's a challenge. Even for somebody, I can tell you, I don't know anybody who thinks it's easy to, to, to do a mile of anything. Certainly not swimming. I, I would drown pretty much if I tried to do a mile of swimming. I'm not a good swimmer. Um, I think ish on a bike. A bike is maybe a little easier, but it's still, you know, it's still a few minutes on a bike. Um, certainly walking a mile is a decent amount. You know, if you get out and walk a mile right now, you're going to be out there for a little bit. You're going to have 15, 20 minutes. And running a mile by about the third, if you do it in a, in a track, the third lap, you're a little pooped. It's like, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I thought I did, did you go, did it, did you Good for you. I did it in 10 minutes. You did it in 10 minutes? Yes. Good for you. Yeah, for you. That's, 10 minutes, not so hard. That's a hard thing. That's, if, you, if, if you've ever done a 10 minute mile, that, you know, that's great. That's really good. That's about a 6.0 pace on a treadmill. Get on there and try that, guys. That's that's hard. And the thing is, you kept it for you know for a long time. So good for you. It, and that's the thing you have to remember. It wouldn't have mattered if you did a 15 minute pace. It wouldn't have mattered if you did a 20 minute pace. You just do it. Just do a mile. Today. Try doing a mile today. If you, you'll notice it'll make a difference. It gets your blood flowing. You don't have to run. You can walk. But it'll get your blood flowing. You'll be breathing. You'll be kind of like a little movement kind of happens. Yeah, I encourage it. So get up and move around. Um, yeah, listen to some music if it makes you feel good. Get your space, kind of gives you time to think. Um, if you have a dog, walk your dog, you know? Uh, I have a little bitty dog, but I just walked him already this morning. Uh, but yeah, I, I, health is right there with, with I, I mean, I'm gonna say well. But, because <laughs> they're right. Thank you so much, all of you. I hope you learned something.